speak forth under the anointing of the Spirit of God. Amen. Amen. Can you all hear clearly? My mic on. I preached in a church once and said, Can you all hear me clearly? Somebody in the back, right in the back said, I can, but I'm prepared to somebody else to come and take my place. <laughs> Bernardo, what is the, that tower in Italy called? The tower of Pisa. Do you know when it was first built, what was it called? No, no, no. It was called the Tower of Pisa. Now what do they call it? The Leaning Tower. Why? Now I'll tell you why. Because the builders, after they put it up, the one builder said to the other, he said, I've skimped on the foundations, but no one will ever know. <laughs> All right, why I'm saying that is, we've got a foundation which is the Word of God. Amen. And what I want to speak to you about this morning is, I believe one of the most important foundational studies that we will ever undertake. And so I want to speak to you on why I believe that this Bible, this book, is the Word of God. It's absolutely essential to understand what we believe and why we believe it. Because if you look at the world today, Islam is permeating nearly every society. There's wars, there's rumors of wars, there's murder, there's decapitation, there's forcing people to do this and that. They just stoned a couple in Iran and Iraq because they had committed adultery. So they killed them, but in the meantime they cut people's heads off. That doesn't matter. I don't understand that. So we've got a, a huge dilemma. And I've said many times that if the devil had one weapon, this is my understanding, what would it be? Confusion. The devil confuses people. So now, why do we believe the Bible to be the Word of God? I put it in your notes. You don't have to look at it now, but it's on the bulletin. And I want to touch some very important things by the grace of God. There are 2,700 claims in this book by the writers of this book. They claim and say, The Lord God said. The Lord told me. God spoke to me 2,700 times. They say, those make those statements, God told me, God said. Now, either it is the greatest hoax that has ever been foisted on humanity, or it is the Word of God. And we know from history that the man that changed the world more than any other person at any time ever was the Lord Jesus Christ. The world has never been the same. Even, even our dates are dated to his time. When he came, AD this, AD 1, 2, 3 and so on. And uh, we're now living in the year 2014. According to the Gentile calendar, the Jewish calendar is different to that. So I want to touch on five areas this morning. I want to touch on scientifically. I don't just believe this is God's word because my mom and dad told me it was, or because the church told me it was, or because it's tradition. Tradition is the greatest obstacle to truth. Be careful of tradition. I'm not saying all tradition is wrong, but if you believe in tradition before you leave believe in truth, you're in trouble. So I want to touch on five areas scientifically. Historically, I want to speak about the marvelous unity. I want to speak just a little while about fulfilled prophecy. And I want to speak about durability, that it's lasted all these years, scientifically. Genesis 1.1 says, in the beginning God created. It's a Hebrew word, in the beginning, Elohim, plural. I believe Father, Son, Holy Spirit created. Until recent times, 
For centuries, people believed the earth lived on a giant platform. People believed that the earth was like this, and that it was a platform. And if you got in your ship and you sailed along, Rolf and Janice, and you got to certain spot, you fell out of the side, and you were gone. <coughs> so they were always looking to see if they'd come to the end of the earth. Because they all believed we were living on a flat platform. But in Job chapter 26 and verse 7, Job writes and says, God hangs the earth on nothing. There's no foundation, there's no platform. He just hangs the earth on nothing. Job wrote about that one of the, the most ancient of all writings. Job had already seen that God hangs the earth on nothing. Only since men have circumnavigated the globe or gone around the planet, traveled all to all areas, have they considered it other than some flat surface, just a flat surface. But Isaiah the prophet wrote in Isaiah 40 and verse 22, it says this, It is he that sits on the circle of the earth. Isaiah wrote about that that long ago. In 125 AD, the scientist Hipparchus counted the stars. He used to spend his nights out there and counted one, two, three, four, he counted. That's why his life's work counting stars. And he came to a place where he counted there were 1,022 stars in the universe. And he made his statement. And people accepted that and believed that there were 1,022 stars. Scientists, I'm not saying they don't do a good thing, but I heard this, something on uh, the news the other day. The scientist said this, and it just blew me away. He said, about some distant planet, he said, that was discovered or made or came into existence 15.6 billion years ago. Not 16 million years ago, billion. 15.6. I said, you are stupid. <laughs> but the problem is that people believe it. Now, I've told this story before, and to me it's one of the most humorous stories. And if you've heard it before, please excuse me, but the chappie at the museum, and they, people were coming to the museum, and they looked at this uh, fossil, the Neanderthal man, and they said, how old is this fossil to the, the key, the, end, the, the chap who looked after the, the objects? And he said, well, this particular fossil is 12 million and 8 years old. I said, yeah. How can you be so specific? He said, well, I've been working here for 8 years. When I got here, it was 12 million years old. <laughs> Ibarata said, there's 1,000. He counted the stars. In the year 1600, Galileo startled humanity by saying that the stars of heaven cannot be numbered. Cannot be numbered. There are so many. John Herschel, who invented the first giant telescope, confirmed Galileo's statement. He said, you cannot number the stars. <coughs> But in Jeremiah 33, verse 22, we read this. The stars, the host of heaven, cannot be numbered. Jeremiah wrote about that. Thousands of years ago. In 1615, William Harvey discovered the circulation of the blood. Up until then, people had no idea about what the blood did or what happened. But in Leviticus 17 and verse 14, Moses wrote, The life of all the flesh is in the blood. So Moses knew about it long ago because God showed him. Sir James Simpson, a Bible-believing Christian invented 
Floriform. Do you remember the days of Floriform? It's probably only for us sort of more senior people. Floriform was a dreadful thing. But it did put you to sleep, but you had bad dreams. I don't know. Did anyone here have an operation under chloroform? Did you sleep? I had one in my tonsils. You were, it's dreadful, isn't it? But it at least put you to sleep. Sir James Simpson invented chloroform. And the reason he did, he was inspired by the words in Genesis 2.21. He read this in, in those words. God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. He said, that's what we've got to do when we operate. Put him to sleep. And I'm so pleased I'm living now and not 300 years ago. Don't know about you. Because when you had your tooth out 300 years ago, it was, it's a traumatic experience now, but it was a more traumatic experience 300 years ago. Because you bit a stick and you probably drank a bottle of whiskey or whatever it was, and then that's, that's it. I thank God every day. I say, Lord, thank you for a roof over my head, clothes to wear, food to eat. And thank you that we've got all the comforts of this day. I really mean that. But the most important one about scientific evidence is this. And it's only in recent times that people have understood this. I don't know if the scriptures are all, are they all coming up? My Christopher, you are really very good. Bible scoffers, people who said, ah, I don't believe this. They kept on pointing out contradictions and say the Bible isn't in tune with things. And the Lord didn't understand what's going on. But Jesus in Luke 17 made a statement. He spoke about his return. He said, when I come, I'm going to come in that day and in that night. And people said, He's, he's made a mistake. It's either day or either night. Because the sun comes up there and it's day and the sun goes down there, it's night. But they didn't understand that it was day here and night in Australia or night here and day in, in America or wherever it was. Because they didn't understand that we were living on a globe. An Indian chap he once was worked out. He used to see the sun come up and see it go down. And uh, he, he pondered it. He spoke to his, his wife and said, what's going on? Where does the sun go to? They said, well, I don't know where it goes to. So one night he said, I'm going to stay up all night and see what happens. Where does it go to? And so the Indian stayed up the whole night waiting, waiting, and finally it dawned on him. <laughs> See, the world is night and day at the same time. Now we think, here, everybody knows that. But you know, three, four hundred years ago, not everybody knew that at all. In fact, if you proposed that, you were, you were classed as a little bit funny. Historically, scoffers stated that Moses could not have written the first five books of the Bible, as there was no writing in his time. They said it's just a fallacy, it's a hoax. Dr. Petri discovered the Tel Tel Amarna stones, and it was verified that there was writing at least 200 years before Moses. In Luke 19, Jesus said, If we should hold their peace, the very stones would cry out. They did. Do you remember the statement of Jesus about the temple? Um, about, he said, the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed and not one stone would be left upon another. Do you remember that? After the crucifixion and the ascension, the resurrection, the ascension, uh, in AD 70 the Romans and the Titus Vespasian came upon Jerusalem and broke just about everything and smashed parts of the temple. And a Roman soldier looked and he saw in the temple walls a little wedge of gold. And he pried it up, and the others saw it. And because of one little piece of gold, all the soldiers came and they took every stone and broke it down. Not one stone would be left upon another. They never found any more gold, but every stone was destroyed to fulfill that prophecy. Most amazing thing. Now, probably the greatest 
miracle that faces humanity every day is this. This book, the contents of it, let me, let me just say this to you, please don't ever uh, worship the book. I know people that won't go to bed at night unless they've got their Bible next to them because they feel safe with that book. That can become an idol, bibliolatry. Because we're not trusting in that book, we're trusting in the Christ of that book. We're trusting in the real Word of God, the living Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's what we trust in. But this Bible is made up of 66 different letters, manuscripts. Written by 40 different people. 66 different books written by 40 different people over 1,000, over a period of 1,600 to 2,000 years. That never knew each other, most of them. Hardly any of them even met the other, knew the other, saw the other, or had access to what the others had written. Forty writers, over a period of 1,600 to 2,000 years, sit down and pen and say, God showed me to this, the Lord told me to do this, and this will happen, and that will happen, and they wrote those words. And the most amazing, miraculous thing is, they all tell the same story. They all tell the same story. That there's a God who loves us. That sin is rampant in the world and that we can get saved from our sin if we come with the Lamb. They all tell the same story. And they prophesy and make many other statements. But there's no contradiction in the 40 writers and there's 66 books over this vast period of time. Some was written by a herdsman like Amos was just looking after the cattle and the sheep. And he, in the, in, 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 the, in the grass fields, he wrote down and penned those words. David the king penned words. Solomon penned words. Moses, the great lawgiver, God speaks to him on the mountain, he pens words. The, 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 some of the New Testament writers probably had access to one another, like Peter, James, and John. But by and large, most of them never even met the other, knew about the other, didn't even know about their existence. And these 66 books all tell me that I'm a sinner and I'm in need of God. And that there's a God who loves me. It's, it's marvelous. If, if I never had anything else, I'd say, that is not humanly possible. And it's not. And they wrote it in three different languages. Hebrew, Greek, and Aramaic. I've got to be careful when I preach with Alistair here, because he's a real fundy on knowledge. You've got to watch, watch all your words, because he'll check you out. You know, when Alistair preaches, he's got the most marvelous mind on facts and figures. I just sit back and I listen, I say, and I hope he doesn't look at me and say, Neil, is that right? Because I'd have to say, gee, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we just love it, Alistair. <coughs> so we're, we're not prepared. You know what I do these days when I prepare messages like this? Any message, I make absolutely sure of all my facts. Because I preached once in a church a long time ago. About, uh, on the Mount of Olives when Jesus rose from the dead 500 people were there to see him ascend into heaven not the real rising of the dead, his ascension and a woman in the church came to me and said where did you get that from? so I said well it's in the book of Acts she said no it didn't say there were 500 when he ascended, it just said there were 500 on the Mount at one time I checked it out. So I went to John Stackman, who was the leader of the Assemblies of God at that time. I said, John, I've spoken this in your church. What should I do? He says, tell him you had a special revelation from God. <laughs> so, but that taught me a lesson. So now I double check everything. Because we want truth, don't we? We don't want nonsense. We want truth. 
66 books, 40 writers, over 1,600 years, kings, shepherds, scholars, lawgivers, herdsmen, all wrote and tell the same story. It's fantastic. And then there's the principle of firsts and seconds. I put it in the bulletin not long ago. I don't know if you've ever thought of the principle of firsts and seconds. Just, I've got a special page of it. The first Adam, sinful, and the second Adam, Jesus Christ, sinless. The first brother Cain, making his own offering, ending up a murderer. And the second brother Abel, preparing and offering God's way a lamb being accepted. In Ishmael, the son of man's misguided compromise, and Isaac, the son of promise. In Esau, the first being discarded, and Jacob, the second born, being accepted. And Jacob was a scoundrel. When I read about Jacob's life and I see God made a covenant with him, I say, I think I might make it, Lord. Because <laughs> he was a scoundrel. But he trusted God. It's not how good you are or how good I am. It's whether we trust God. In Saul and David, the first and second rulers in Israel, Saul was the first king, discarded, David accepted. And David was also a scoundrel. If you read Psalm 51 and read David's prayer, asking God, and saying sorry, and he comes out with the thing, he says, whatever you do, Lord, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. The first covenant of Law, thou shalt, thou shalt not, thou, 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 all that. If you really want to get confused, read the book of Leviticus and go through all the different things and you will not know where you are. But, the second covenant of grace. God is big. Listen to me, God is bigger than your mistakes. I'm so glad about that. Perhaps you haven't made any mistakes, you're all right. Is there anyone here who's never made a mistake? Would you stand? Is only one person standing? God is bigger than our mistakes. The first requ requirement of works. The second requirement of faith. Most of the religions are trying to work. It's Jesus plus, Jesus plus, Jesus plus, Jesus plus, or whatever it is. Works, works, works. Trusting God is Jesus only. It's not plus my good works. For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Not of works, lest anyone should boast. And then the next verse in Ephesians 2, and I think at verse 10, it says, But you are saved unto good works. I'm helping some person or some people at the moment in various ways, and somebody said to me on the phone yesterday, Do you have to do it? It's not your responsibility to do that. But it is you. Because Matthew 25, Jesus says, When I was sick, you visited me. When I was in prison, you comforted me. When I was hungry, you fed me. When I saw the food coming in here this morning, I got so excited because we're not, we're not doing that because we're now trying to impress God, but we saved unto good works to do something. I didn't do any of that. It's nothing like I can claim anything, but we had to do good works, but we're not saved by our good works. So whether we did that or didn't do it, it doesn't make any difference to our salvation because we are saved by grace. The first birth after the flesh, and the second birth after the spirit. You see, 
we, we, we in this realm, this earthly realm, but God's realm is another dimension. It's a spiritual dimension. Miles Monroe says, it's, yeah, it's right here. I just love Miles Monroe's preaching. He's just got a way about it. Just, I, just, I just love the way he opens it up. And he, I, he has me still go. I just sit and listen and listen. He said, it's, yeah, it's another dimension. And the only way you can get into that dimension is through a door. John 10, Jesus says, I'm the door. By me, if any man is in, he's the door. Spiritual birth. I got confirmed at the age of 30 in an Anglican church. I didn't go to church. I just, for some reason, I don't know why, but anyway, I went, got confirmation class, got confirmed. But about three years later, I got converted. I was born of the Spirit of God, and I called a meeting, and there were 70 Anglican priests at that meeting, I think, if I got it correct, something like that. And the rector there was Basil French. And I said this to all of them. And I said, with respect to you, I'm not hammering you, I'm not saying anything. I came here and got confirmed. But I left here, I was a confirmed sinner. And they looked at me, I don't know if they were angry or what. I said, but last week I gave my life to Christ. And I'm washed free in the blood. I'm born again in the spirit of the living God. And I remember on one of the news broadcasts in Zimbabwe, Basil French was doing a uh, religious broadcast and he said, the most amazing thing happened, a friend of mine, and he named me, said, he was born again of the Spirit of God. I said, well, what does that mean? He said, I don't know how it all works, but I'll tell you this, it has changed his life. Because he's a church I used to go to before I even went to church. <coughs> And I wasn't a church goer, and I wasn't a Christian, and I wasn't anything. But I used to get, take my tithe every every Friday. I take ten percent of my money, and I gave it to a church. Knocked on the cathedral door one day, said, "Yes, my tithe." I think I was the only tithing non-member of that church. I was probably the only tithing person in that church. I don't know. But when you're born of the Spirit of God, and it was only years later I was born of the Spirit of God, I realized there's another dimension. God's in it. That's why Jesus says in John 3, you must be born again. And it's a spiritual thing. And I believe that He drops a seed in us right inside. And in that resurrection day, that seed just springs to life. The first body physical and the second body glorified. This is a physical body. I don't know if anyone watched the rugby yesterday. I'm not sure it affects everybody. But did you see Joost van der Vestas? That great rugby player. What's this disease he's got? Motor neuron disease. They brought this wonderful, marvelous man. his body's going. And if you see I tremble a little bit, it's not nerves. My body's going. I know God can hear it. And I'm not muttering and I'm not complaining. But my body's going. Our bodies are going. You might not know that your body's going, but it's going. But there's a new body. Glorified body. Uh, Mark Hancock said we're going to look 33. I think that's about right. Isn't that a wonderful age to look at? Yeah. About 33. We're going to get new bodies. No sickness, no sin, no crying, no pain for the former things have passed away. It's got to be better than this. I just watch the news and I, I drive into Isikolobomi uh, quite often and I see how some of the people live and I say, God, it's got to be better than this and it's going to be. You believe in God, believe also in me, in my Father's house of many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go and prepare a place for you. And if I prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself. That where you are, there I, I will be also. That where I am, there you will be also. It's going to be better. Steve Clute is going to look like 
better than it looks now. <laughs> it's going to be I, You know, I really believe it with all my heart that God is going to fix us up. Otherwise, life is pointless. You might as well eat, drink, and be merry and just say, well, what on earth? What's going on? But it's going to be better. I watch the news and I watch the TV and everything is about saving for your old age. Forget about the old age, it's the eternal age we must worry about. That's the most important age. Because in your old age you don't need a lot, you need a lot less than you need in your young age. The eternal age is important. It's not the journey in the train that counts how good the journey is, it's the destination. The first body temporal, the second body eternal. The first heaven and earth to pass away, and the new heaven and new earth. Now I love the I love the earth, I love the sea, I love sport, I love I love life. But it's going to be better than this. Just a few more things. Fulfilled prophecies. We broke bread this morning, and we. Remembered the Lord's death upon the cross for our sins. There were 50, five naught, 50 specific prophecies fulfilled at Calvary. In Psalm 22, David writes and says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The prophecies about the cross, you read them in Psalm 2 and many other places, <coughs> that Jews, Gentiles, kings and rulers would participate. That Jesus would be sold for silver. That he, he would be betrayed by a friend. You remember Jesus said to his disciples, he said, one of them is a devil. Speaking about Judas Iscariot. But you know the most amazing thing is. They were together for three and a half years. The twelve. And when it came to the last supper. Not one of them knew it was Judas. <laughs> Imagine you being with twelve friends. And you know one of them is going to betray you. And you didn't tell the other eleven anything. You never hinted at it. You never treated him differently. You never gave him any indication. That's Jesus. I love that. They said one, uh, he would be given vinegar to drink, to quench his thirst. And they would cast lots for his garments. And I've got a book and give you all 50 specific prophecies fulfilled at the cross. Way beyond any chance. Durability. I don't know if you've heard of the infidel Voltaire, the unbeliever Voltaire. He was this man that didn't believe in God. He said this, he made a statement. 340 years ago he stated this. He said, in 50 years, this book, the Bible, will be a forgotten book. He said, it's rubbish. It'll be forgotten. You know, recently, one of the first Bibles that was printed was sold at an auction for one million rand. And 92 volumes of Voltaire were sold for an equivalent of 8 rand. The, the, the Bible's not a forgotten book. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Now, I've given you a lot of facts and a lot of things, and there's more if you want. But read it. Don't just put it in the side of your bed. Just read a few pages every day. What I do in the morning, I get up, I've got a computer, and I put it on, and I see what it brings up so that I don't pre-program it, and I read a bit of others, but I just... I, have a look at each chapter. Have a look at what's what and I go through it. I wake up and pray a short prayer, not a long prayer. You don't have to pray for three or four hours. Just pray. Start your day with God. And then read something from God because we need to listen as well. 
and then come to fellowship like you're doing. It's marvelous. And then when I go to bed, I commit the night to God. Look, Lord, look after me. And so on. And I pray for a few. I pray for a few of you folks, by the way. Did you know that? I do. I name you to God. I say, God, pray for this one and this one and this one. And then I go to bed and jump in and just off I go. But I know this, that the days coming soon will be here when the Lord returns. And uh, He's going to take us home. So Steve made a request earlier that if anyone here doesn't know the Lord, to come out to the front. I don't know if you're saved or you're not saved. But uh, I want to ask Steve to pray for me again for my Parkinson's. Because I'm believing God to set me free. I believe He can set me free. If He doesn't, I'll do like Job. Though He slay me, yet will I trust Him. But I'd like to be free if it's possible. So you might have needs or whatever. Steve can come and just take over. God bless you, folks. Love you all lots.